Good morning and welcome to worship with us here at South Windsor Citadel on the second Sunday of Advent. We pray that as we continue on our journey through this Christmas season, that it would be a particularly special one for you this year and that the Lord would, in a tangible way, just draw our hearts back to worshiping and adoring his son, Jesus, our Savior. Before we get into the service and all the special Christmas music, let's dedicate this morning to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this second Sunday of Advent. Lord, we thank you for this time of preparation. Lord, when we prepare ourselves to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ, on Christmas Day, Lord. And Lord, we are also mindful that we are to also prepare ourselves because we are told in your word that Jesus is coming again. And so, Father, during this special time of year, we pray that the Christmas carols would touch us and, most importantly, that they would remind us of our dear Savior's birth. Lord, be glorified this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. second Sunday of Advent. Repent, change your ways, be baptized. Based on Matthew chapter 3 verses 1 to 12. John the Baptist proclaimed, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And the people went out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sin. And John said, I baptize with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. We light the first candle to remind us to keep awake and be ready. We light the second Advent candle to remind us to change our ways. Good morning, my name is Major Danny Pinkson and I am the Executive Director at the Salvation Army Windsor Center of Hope. On Thursday, November 18th, the Salvation Army has commenced its annual Christmas Kettle Campaign. The Christmas Kettle Campaign is the annual largest public fundraiser that the Salvation Army holds across the territory. This year we have a local fundraising goal of $350,000. And the funds that we raise from the Christmas Kettle Campaign go to support throughout the entire year our programs and services, like our Housing with Supports program, like our uh, Homeless Shelter, like our uh, Pathway of Hope program. We offer life skills training. 
We do our community and family services. So the funds that we collect through our annual campaign helps to support these programs and services. If you like a complete listing of our programs and services, you can go to our website at SalvationArmyWindsor.ca. And just to let you know, last year in this region, the Salvation Army provided thousands and thousands of warm meals. We provided hundreds of men with a warm place to stay and three meals a day. We provided hundreds of families with the basic staples of life, of food and clothing and personal care items. Last year, we provided hundreds of children with Christmas toys during the last Christmas season. These are the things we're able to do because of the funds that we receive from our Christmas Kettle Campaign. We are pleased to announce this year, because last year due to COVID, we weren't allowed to have bell ringers, but this year, bell ringers are back, standing next to our kettles again. If, as you visit the retail store throughout the Greater Windsor Region, we invite you to drop by one of our kettle locations to donate. It has been our privilege over the past 100 years here in Windsor to serve the residents. And we are inviting you once again this year, the generous people of the Greater Windsor Region, to help us by supporting our annual Christmas Kettle Campaign. It is important to note that every dollar that we raise in this campaign stays locally to help the programs and services that we offer here in this region. I want you to know that we cannot do what we do without you, for you are the army behind the army. And so once again, there's a need for bell ringers, there's a need for Christmas kettle volunteers, and this year in particular, the need is significant. There's an old axiom or proverb which says, it is better to give than receive. This year, by being a, a bell ringer, it's an opportunity for you to give, to give back to our campaign by serving in this capacity. And if you'd like to become a bell ringer or a Christmas kettle volunteer this year, we invite you to go to our website at SalvationArmyWindsor.ca and all the information is on the main page of how you can sign up and become a bell ringer with us today. I want to thank you for helping us to serve others Help, helping us to give hope today. God bless you.
scripture reading this morning is from the book of Luke, chapter 1, starting in verse 26. The birth of Jesus foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Mary visits Elizabeth. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. May God richly add a blessing to his word this morning. Once in royal David city stood a lonely cattle shed, where a mother laid her baby in a manger for his bed. Mary was that mother mild, Jesus Christ.
Before we reflect on God's word this morning, let's just uh, bow once again in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the way in which you're speaking to our hearts. And Lord, in these moments, we just pray that you would just silence all that competes for our attention and that your spirit would speak in a very audible, very tangible way deep within our hearts. Father, we love you and adore you and just pray that our hearts and our ears would be open to the message you have for each of us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. For many households, one of the gifts under the Christmas tree every year is the most recent edition of the Ripley's Believe It or Not hardcover book. For a number of years, I can recall my younger brother Peter, who would have been a teen teenager at this time, receiving the latest edition of this book at Christmas. Ripley's Believe It or Not books differ from the Guinness Book of World Records in that the feats and claims in Ripley's book are often so bizarre and strange that the reader is left with the difficult choice of whether to believe it or not. If it's odd or somehow unconventional, then you'll find it in Ripley's Believe It or Not books. Some examples of what you might find as you leaf through the pages are Airbed Race At the annual Glen Nevis River Race in Scotland, competitors on inflatable airbeds Don helmets and life jackets to navigate a treacherous 2.4 kilometer course along the Glen Nevis River, tackling white water torrents, rapids, and even a 30 foot waterfall. Believe it or not, high tea. Waiters served lunch to two steel workers perched on a girder high above New York City in 1930. The men were working on the construction of the 47-story, 625-foot-high Woldruff Astoria Hotel on Park Avenue. Believe it or not. pocket size pad. Quay House in Conway, Wales, is one of the smallest houses in the world, at just six feet wide and ten feet long. Now this cottage seems like my ideal home. The fisherman's cottage squeezes a fireplace, bench, tap, small bed, table, and washstand into about 120 square feet of space, smaller than most people's garages. Quay House was occupied until 1900, and the last owner, Robert Jones, stood six foot three inches tall, believe it or not. Mary, the mother of Jesus, actually found herself in a situation where she was faced with a choice of whether to believe it or not. As the angel Gabriel visits Mary, she is informed that she would give birth to a son and is to give him the name Jesus. This claim from an angelic messenger would be hard enough to believe if Mary had been married. But we are told that Mary is a virgin, not yet married, but pledged to be married to Joseph. Not only is Mary told that she will give birth to a son, she is told that he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The angel goes on to say that the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. I think we would excuse Mary if she had been momentarily overwhelmed by the message Gabriel shares with her. Now, wait a minute here. This seems a little far-fetched, Gabriel. 
ha, 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 who put you up to this? Was this my relative Elizabeth's doing? You just wait till I see her. I'll get back at her for trying to pull this trick on me. Come on, Gabriel, you really expect me to believe what you're telling me? While we don't read of any such responses, Mary obviously had some questions about this claim and asks, How will this be, since I am a virgin? What we find next is informative. The angel doesn't lose his temper and get frustrated with this question. The angel doesn't dismiss Mary as a candidate for bearing the chosen one simply because she dared to ask a question. The angel goes on to provide Mary with a very detailed answer. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God." Okay, that answers Mary's first question, but I'm sure she has a thousand other questions on her mind. Stunningly, we read Mary's response. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Mary was put into an unbelievable situation, and we find that her response is to believe. I think this really shows the depth of Mary's character and her overwhelming trust in God. Somehow I think in some mysterious way, Mary was prepared for something like this to happen. Although we are not given much of Mary's backstory, I find myself feeling as though Mary's whole life up until this point, prepared her to receive such unbelievable news and prepared her to choose to believe. Last week, we discussed how God knows us. He sees us and he hears us when we call. Again, we find that Mary is known by God. The angel Gabriel uses her name in the course of conversation and also uses the name of her relative, Elizabeth. This reminds us once again that we are each intimately known by God. However, in his greeting to Mary, Gabriel provides further insight into our relationship with God. In Gabriel's initial, initial greeting, we hear him say, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Not only does God know us, not only does God see us and hear us, God is with us. And God, who knows all and sees all, was very pleased with Mary. I think it is insightful how Mary addresses herself in her final response to the angel. I am the Lord's servant. Mary obviously loved God and trusted him with her whole life, which may explain to us why she was so quick to believe the angel's message. Mary's relative Elizabeth shares some prof very profound words upon her greeting with Mary. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Mary was put into an astonishingly unbelievable situation, and she chose to believe. If I were to be honest with you this morning, I have had, at times, struggled to believe. Growing up as a child to parents who were committed Christians, attending Sunday school at the Salvation Army in Victoria, 
I wholeheartedly believed in God. But as I grew a little older and began to enter into those preteen and teenage years, sadly, it became more difficult for me to simply believe. Inwardly, I began to question a lot about God and the Bible. To be honest, at this stage in my life, I probably would have found it easier to believe all the crazy claims in a Ripley's Believe It or Not book than some of the claims in the Bible. In some ways, I withdrew my unwavering allegiance to God and entered into a season in my life where I questioned everything. My commitment to God was no longer unconditional as I tried to navigate and settle on what I truly believed. For many years, I sat on the proverbial fence. On one side of the fence was unbelief, not believing anything the Bible said was true, and on the other side of the fence was believing everything in the Bible was in fact true. There I sat on this fence in the middle of these two sides for many, many years. In some ways, I suppose I was scared to get off the fence. During this period of my life, there was something missing deep within me. I tried to fill this void with other things, relationships, alcohol, work, but they could not bring into my life what I was missing. Do you know what it was that was absent in my life? Peace. During this period in my life, there was a constant inner wrestling. I remember giving my testimony one Sunday morning back at the Salvation Army in Victoria, and I explained that it felt as though there was a black wolf and a white wolf fighting within me. There was fairly consistently inner turmoil. I had been faced with the decision whether to believe it or not, and instead of making a decision, I kept kicking the decision further and further down the road. And as a result, I did not experience a true inner peace for many, many years. However, unlike myself, I get this sense that upon making the decision to believe the message of the angel Gabriel, that Mary had this overwhelming sense of peace. In her heart, she had made the choice to believe, and as, as I read her response to Gabriel, I can't help but think that this response could only come from someone who had deep inner peace. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. There is no sense of hesitancy, no sense that Mary was sitting on the fence about this whole situation. Mary doesn't say, well, I really don't know about this. I, I suppose it would be okay if this happened. Or are you sure you got the right person? Mary had resolved in her heart that she would believe, and so her response comes from a position of deep trust. As was mentioned a few Sundays ago, on August the 24th, 2008, at the age of 29, I finally made a personal decision to put an end to sitting on the proverbial fence when I made the leap to become a senior soldier within the Salvation Army. In doing so, I made the decision that I would believe that what God said in the Bible was true, that I would put an end to this never-ending paralyzation that sitting on the fence caused. Did all my doubts completely vanish? No. As I continue to read God's words, do doubts sometimes enter my mind? Sure. 
However, despite the uncertainty, I have made the choice that I am going to believe and allow God to work out those lingering questions as I continue in a trusting relationship with him. A few weeks after becoming a senior soldier, I packed up my little Ford Ranger truck with some of my belongings and headed across the country to Brantford, Ontario to begin a new life as I continued to court Laura, who had gone back to university. Do you know what else accompanied me as I left my family and friends who I had grown up with back on Vancouver Island? A tremendous amount of inner peace. I can't help but find from my own personal experience a tangible relationship a correlation between belief and peace, that you can't really have one without the other, that until we choose to believe it or not, we deny ourselves a tremendous gift, the gift of peace. As we find ourselves on this second Sunday of Advent, I suppose the question for us to consider is, whether we believe it or not. Do we believe the Christmas story of our Savior Jesus' birth, or more broadly, do we believe in the wider good news story of the Bible? Do we believe that we have a God who knows us, who sees us, who hears us, and is with us in all things? In addition, for each of us to reflect on is the question about peace. On this Advent Sunday of peace, if we were to be honest with ourselves, are we experiencing a deep inner peace that the trials of this life cannot shake? Or is there a void in our lives that this morning we recognize is caused by an absence of peace? Are you, like I was in the past, sitting on the proverbial fence of unbelief and belief? What would it take for you to get off that fence and choose to truly believe this morning? This morning, may we each contemplate the actions and response of Mary and make a decision to wholeheartedly believe. Please allow me to guide you in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we just come before you. And Lord, we thank you for the ways in which you've spoken to us in days gone by. Lord, the ways in which we have recognized your presence in our life. And Lord, we just pray that in these moments, as we contemplate the Christmas story and the reaction of Mary, the mother of Jesus, to this incredible claim by the angel Gabriel and her choice to believe. Father, we pray that you would stir within us through your Holy Spirit a desire this day to choose to believe. Lord, that as we make that choice, Father, that you would continue to provide the answers to all the doubts that we still have. But, Father, that we would make the choice to take a step, a step of faith, a step of trust, and choose to believe in your word this day and all the promises that it has for us. And Lord, as we do so, we will find your gift of peace. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the season of Advent. And Lord, thank you so much for the birth of your, our Savior, Jesus, who we celebrate at Christmas. May you bless each one this day. In Jesus' matchless name, amen.
our benediction this morning is Mary's song from Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 6, 46. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Thank you for joining us for worship here at South Windsor Citadel. Be assured of our thoughts and prayers, and if we could ever assist you in your journey of faith with the Lord, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'd love to help guide you and share a prayer with you. Go in the Lord's peace this day. Be blessed. Music